another still life painter, and uh, she is from uh, the North Lowlands, she's Dutch or Netherlandish, um, is Maria von Ostervik. Uh, she was born in 1630 and died in 1693. Uh, she was born near, near Delft. Uh, she lived part of her life in Delft, part of her life in Amsterdam. Uh, and she's known as a still life painter and a flower painter. Uh, we actually do know her birth date, August 20th, 1630. And we know what her father's profession was. He was a Dutch Reformed minister. Now, the Dutch Reformed Church is a Calvinist church, and it is also the state religion of the Netherlands. Although the Netherlands are fairly famous for not persecuting minority religions in the 17th century, uh, which was highly unusual actually. Uh, but they did have a state religion, which was Dutch Reformed. Now, we do have some documents about her, uh, but some of the information about her life comes from a book, uh, Arnold Hobrocken, The Great Theater of Dutch Painters. And this, as you can see, was written in uh, 1718 to 21 and published uh, several times later. There are some documents on her life that gives us some information about her. And we also have a kind of literary source for information, uh, which is uh, another one of these books on the artists. Uh, this is Arnold Hobrocken, The Great Theater of Dutch Painters which he wrote between 1718 and 1721, and then was published several times uh, later in the century. Now, he tells us some really interesting stories about uh, Maria von Osterweich. Uh, he tells us that she was very devout. And he also says that, he, that she studied with Jan Davidson de, de Herm. Now, de Herm is a very famous Dutch uh, still life painter. Uh, and it doesn't seem very likely that Osterweich would have been his pupil because de Haim wasn't in the same places as Osterweich was. Um, he was born in Utrecht. He's a nether, uh, an artist from the Netherlands. He's Dutch. Uh, but he moved to Antwerp, and he's working in Antwerp. Uh, he's also worked in Leiden. But he works in Antwerp for a, probably a little over 30 years. And that's the time when uh, Maria von Osterweich would have been being trained. Uh, and uh, de Ham is not in the same country. <laughs> um, he's down in Flanders. And the painting that you're seeing is one of Maria von Osterweich's flower still lifes. Uh, I'll show you the ones that I was able to get images of. Now, another really interesting story that Hobrocken tells is about another painter uh, his name is Wilhelm von Alst, and Wilhelm von Alst was also a well-known still life painter. And uh, they evidently lived next door, or they were neighbors, and um, he evidently wanted to marry Maria. And he kept bugging her, <laughs> essentially, uh, asking her to marry her. But she had decided that she didn't really want to marry because she was so devoted to her art. She was wedded to her art. So she made some conditions. She said, all right, well, Willem, I'll marry you if you can show that you are as devoted to art as I am. Can you match the hours of, day, of the day that I work? He says, if you can work every day for a year, for 10 hours a day, I'll marry you. He couldn't do it. <laughs> he failed. Um, and so I think it's interesting. Uh, that is one of the, the things, of course, we often hear about women in, in different walks of life, that they have to work so much harder uh, to get anywhere, not even to get the recognition uh, of the men. The men don't expect to work that hard. The women expect to. Uh, the old saw that I learned when I was uh, growing up was uh, a woman has to work twice as hard to get half as far. And I remember when I thought that, I thought, oh, well, then I'll just work four times as hard. I think I was in my 50s when I realized that if a man was working eight hours a day, I would have to work 32 hours a day to, be, to do work four times as much. Um, and uh, I didn't know quite what to do at that point. <laughs> but it underscores how devoted she was to her art and how hard she worked at it and how seriously she took it. 
Now, we don't know, of course, if uh, the story is exactly true, but it could be because we do know that they were neighbors uh, and so that they, they would have known each other. Most of the works that we have by Maria von Ostervik are flower paintings. And there are some records that indicate that she had works purchased by uh, various noblemen, uh, the Emperor Leopold, uh, Louis XIV of France, Stadt, Stadtholder Wilhelm, Wilhelm <laughs> William uh, III, and the King of Poland. As I said, most of her works are flower paintings. And one thing we should realize is that all of the still lifes were not uh, paid equally. Flower painters uh, were the best paid specialty. And so that's one reason, of course, that, uh, uh, that uh, artists would love to specialize in flowers. Uh, flowers are very, very beloved by the Dutch, uh, as you probably know. And, um, well, well, we'll mention the tulip passion, <laughs> the, the, tulip, the tulip market uh, a little bit later. But uh, flowers are very much loved by the Dutch and uh, they loved pictures of flowers. Uh, Oostreich often has very complicated flower images. I think this is a very good example here uh, from the Cincinnati Museum of Art. Uh, the vase is set on a marble uh, tabletop or slab, and then you have um, great complex shapes of the different uh, flowers and petals and objects. Um, and these seem to have a kind of act activity about them. Uh, as you can see, the way the flower petals are, uh, are opening and uh, the leaves are drooping and uh, various things like this. Um, sometimes you see these green and white striped leaves which give uh, another uh, example of a pattern and uh, color interest to the, uh, the still lifes. Now, one of the things you may notice in this, if you look way on the lower left, uh, you see a red monarch butterfly. And she also incorporates different insects into her pictures. Uh, particularly the butterflies. Um, that's kind of interesting because we do think that there may be some symbolism associated with these uh, a these animals in the pa in the flower paintings. Uh, as you can see, some of the flowers uh, do not seem to be um, in their first uh, full prime of life. They seem to be uh, a, a little bit drooping, a little bit past the full bloom, and the leaves hang down. Um, when you see insects. Um, and overblown flowers, it suggests the idea that life uh, is transitory, you know, continues on. Um, and so we sometimes talk about uh, the vanitas still life. Now, butterflies are interesting because butterflies sometimes are seen as, of course, the insect with a short life, but they also can be seen uh, as a symbol for the soul and of resurrection. Um, so you're not always certain exactly uh, what the meaning is. Uh, but there are certainly some things that you, you could contemplate. Uh, so it's not just a vase of pretty flowers, it may give you a little moral message as well. Probably the most famous painting by Maria von Ostervik is her Vanitas Still Life. Now, this is the first work that we have by her that is dated, uh, at least that's, you know, the ones we have today that we know about. It's in v Vienna, in the Kunst des Schorsche Museum, uh, which translates as the Art History Museum. The idea of a Vanitas still life is a still life that has a definite moral message. And when we talk about uh, a Vanitas image of any type, we're going back to the verse in, in Ecclesiastes, um, where the uh, author writes, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And essentially uh, goes through all of the things that are of the world, whether it's study or wealth, uh, all of these things. Uh, and then there is the, the refrain almost, uh, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Uh, the idea that all worldly things are in vain, they're all empty, they're all meaningless. Um, that's a very Calvinist message, isn't it? I mean, it can be used by people who are not Calvinists as well, because you do see uh, Vanitas uh, images and uh, the Vanitas uh, theme in Catholic art as well. Um, but it, it seems that the Vanitas still lives did develop in the Netherlands, around in Leiden perhaps, around the 1620s. And they may be associated with Calvinist uh, theology, uh, very sober, 
And remember that Maria's mother, um, excuse me, that remember that Maria's father was a Calvinist minister. Uh, so it would be uh, appropriate for her as a painter to have a painting with a moral message. Uh, these have a number of still life objects in them that refer to the transitory uh, condition of life. Um, that life is brief and that all worldly pursuits are in the long run empty, useless, meaningless. Now, Many different Vanitas images, there's all sorts of way, ways and things that can be included in these. Uh, but generally, you often have uh, objects that are symbolic of worldly pursuits. And these can be things that are professional uh, or personal that people might have and treasure. Uh, they could be things even like artist tools, uh, books, scientific instruments. Now, to us, well, you know, we would probably say, well, these seem to be very important things, but we're talking about a religious view that says that the only things that are important is the life hereafter, uh, that you can't take it with you, essentially. Uh, so no matter how smart you are, uh, no matter how famous you are, uh, you, you know, your life will end. Uh, also, obviously, uh, there are objects that um, symbolize wealth and power, uh, things like coins, money, per uh, purses, uh, account books, uh, precious objects like gems. I don't think we have any gems in this picture, but uh, these kind of things could be in other um, uh, still lifes in general. And then there's just things that are, are frivolous, you know, goblets of wine or beer, cards or dice, which you can just waste your life on, uh, even musical instruments, you know, I mean, you know what? What's the purpose of that, <laughs> would be the attitude. Uh, soap bubbles are another thing that you, you don't see in this picture, but you sometimes see. I'm thinking there's a painting in the 18th century by Chardin, um, French painter, uh, where he has a boy uh, blowing soap bubbles. And that's supposed to remind you of uh, how transitory life is. It's just very fragile, like a soap bubble. It can burst at any moment. So there are certainly, uh, in these different Vanitas still lives, very often things that show the passage of time. Uh, things like hourglasses, soap bubbles, uh, the, the roses or flowers that are full blown that are starting to wilt or uh, the petals are starting to drop. Um, things like a smoking candle or a candle that has been extinguished, the flame is no longer burning, symbolic of uh, death. And sometimes, not always, there's some hope in the pictures, uh, some references to life after death, um, sometimes some flowers that have symbolic meaning uh, or plants forms, uh, ivy, laurel, some, some things that suggest that there may be uh, some hope that even though you can't take your worldly things with you, you can take spiritual virtues, as it were. We mentioned that uh, it had been suggested that Dehaim was the uh, uh, teacher of Ostervik, and we don't really think that's probably true. Uh, he wasn't in the right place at the right time, but he did paint a few Vanitas still lifes, and so I have pictures here to show you. Um, one of the marks of a Vanitas still life, you can be certain it's a Vanitas still life if you see a still life with a skull in it. I mean, that's, that's definite. It's talking about death. <laughs> um, and so here we have uh, some you know, books, musical instruments, um, some vessels uh, that are overturned, and with, of course, the skull over all of them. In one case, the room looks very, very bare, almost as though what, someone died. They would be unlikely to leave their skull there, but uh, along with their papers. But there certainly is this idea that uh, uh, you, know, you, you can't even take knowledge with you into the afterlife. Uh, these are earlier, as you can see, uh, than Ostervik's. Uh, the one I found a date on was 1629. The other one I didn't find a date on. Um, but they, you know, Dehaim is older. Uh, these would be uh, earlier than Ostervik's. Um, uh, she's she's not, definitely not the first painter to paint uh, Vanitas still lives. Uh, but she is uh, a painter of a very complex and interesting still life, as we'll see. And hers are, as I say, more complex. Uh, De Haim's are, are quite are much simpler. Um, they do become more complex in the second half of the century. And here we see uh, an extremely accomplished Vanita still life by Maria von Ostervik. Um, the composition, uh, all of these forms do work together. 
Uh, there's almost the feeling almost of a kind of uh, right angle triangle if you leave out the flowers of uh, uh, the uh, more neutral colored images with the apex with the globe here. It's a celestial globe as we'll be seeing. Um, and the objects overlap. The textures are different, uh, but they complement each other. Uh, touches of, of reds in with all of these different shades of brown, for example. Now, I tried to list some of the things that are in this painting. Um, there is the skull, uh, which has kind of a wreath of ivory going around its, uh, the skull. Uh, we'll take a look at that in a minute in a, a detail. Let me point out some of these things. Well, I guess I best just tell you where it is. The uh, skull is right beneath the flowers. Um, over in the lower right, as you look at it, uh, there is an hourglass. Uh, of course, you see the flowers, which we've already talked about, the idea of the, the beauty being transient, that it will uh, fade and, and vanish, uh, just like human life. Uh, down here in, you can't, can't really see it very well in the, in the picture, uh, but down in the lower left, there's a little, a little mouse, and he's eating the grain. Uh, and you can also see a little further uh, up and toward the center, right below the skull. We'll have a detail of that, too, as a corn cob, where uh, some of the, some of the uh, kernels have been uh, eaten. They're gone. Uh, we have the globe with the, the zodiac. So this is a celestial globe. Uh, an account book, and uh, there are coins, an ink pot and quill for writing things, whether it's for keeping your accounts or something else. Uh, there's a knapsack in there, um, which may refer to the journey through life. Uh, aqua vita uh, in a flask uh, that I don't have a detail to show this, but it's supposed to reflect the artist, that she's supposed to have put another little uh, image in here. Um, what do some of these things mean? Well, obviously, the skull is very obvious. You know, you die. You have a skull. This tells you it's a vanitas still life. It's about death and how transitory life can be, uh, how all of the things that give you pleasure in life are not going to last into uh, a spiritual realm. We've talked about the vase of flowers and its meaning. Uh, the mouse eating grain, obviously, uh, could be symbolic of time devouring the lives of man. Or sometimes mice are, uh, because they do eat up uh, the grain, they sometimes are seen as uh, symbols of evil or symbols of the devil, even in uh, earlier images. Uh, the globe with the zodiac uh, certainly refers to knowledge, perhaps scientific in interests. Uh, it also has that idea of time. Uh, time is passing you by, and right below it, of course, is very definitely the hourglass, which says that yes, time is passing you by. Um, down there on the lower, uh, below, the, below the skull, right on sort of the edge of the table, uh, there is a flute, and uh, there's uh, books. Uh, music books, and a flute. Uh, these, of course, uh, music is transitory. They didn't have recording devices, so you play on your flute and then it's gone. Uh, also, sometimes seems very frivolous. You could be working rather than making, you know, frivolous music. Um, the ink pot and the quill we've mentioned. You could be writing in your account book. You could be writing something down. Um, you can't take that knowledge with you. Uh, the account book and coins obviously are going to refer to wealth and perhaps to the uh, power that wealth brings, uh, how very worldly, uh, how very useless in the final event. Uh, they're not going to keep you from dying. Um, here we have a detail of some of this, a bit of the account book. Uh, you can see the uh, the corn that's, um, perhaps that mouse <laughs> was eating out the corn earlier, or somehow the corn has been half devoured. Uh, think about the life of man that we expected to go on, cut short. Um, it is kind of interesting, too, because corn, and we're talking about a maize here, not uh, corn in the sense of grain, uh, is a New World grain. It's a New World, it uh, comes from uh, the Americas. Uh, and so it's uh, slightly exotic. It's not native to Europe. Uh, and uh, even, you know, a somewhat exotic uh, plant, uh, which is presumably imported, if not that important uh, in the big scheme of things. Uh, sitting on the account book is a butterfly. Now, butterflies are interesting because, of course, insects, I think, you know, if you have flies or something like that in your picture, or beetles, um, you know, these are often associated with evil. Um, they um, can destroy. They uh, have a very short life, though. 
and so you have this idea of the transitoriness of life. However, butterflies have been considered to be symbols of the resurrection or symbols of the soul. So maybe there is that uh, little bit of hope, you know, that even though all of the worldly things cannot be taken with you, spiritual matters, things that pertain to the soul, uh, can lead you into everlasting life. Now, one of the things that I read was that the ivy is also sometimes considered uh, a symbol of uh, life everlasting. Um, and so, as you can see, it's around the skull. So it's a, you can say, a little contradictory, but maybe a little hope. I have to admit, I look at that ivy and it looks to me like it's wilting. <laughs> so um, I'll let you decide <laughs> what, what, it's, what it's doing.